Good day, everybody. So today we continue with lecture eight, and uh, this continues, or this lecture covers public choice. The prescribed reading is Stiglitz and Rosengard, chapter nine. So specifically, what this lecture covers is individual preferences for public goods, majority voting, and the uh, voting paradox, arrows and possibility theorem, single peak preferences, and the existence of majority voting equilibrium, the median voter, the inefficiency of the majority voting equilibrium, the two-party system, and me the median voter, and the Lindahl equilibrium. So those will be the to topics that we covered in this lecture. So as you will recall, from the previous lecture, we discussed the problem of uh, choice or preferences for public goods. In other words, what is it that government should be providing? What public goods should it be spending money on? So why is it that views differ on what money should be spent on? In other words, what public goods should be provided? Well, there are three reasons. First of all, we have the differences in tastes. So just as some individuals prefer chocolate ice cream and others vanilla, some prefer public parks and education, whereas others prefer private goods such as cars. So in other words, some argue that we should spend more money on public parks uh, and education, whereas others will argue that we should spend money on, let's say, policing for that matter. There's also differences in income. So people with higher incomes normally prefer, prefer to spend more on all goods, both public and private. So that influences how much should be spent on public goods. So if you have a wealthy population, they will prefer more public goods. And then also what we have is we have taxes. So when the government spends more on public goods, rich individuals often have to pay a relatively large share of the additional cost. And obviously for those reasons, they are not happy. So it is not possible to raise taxes infinitely in order to fund expenditure on public goods. So then we go back to the concept of the tax price. And if you recall what the tax price is, it is the additional amount an individual must pay when government expenditures increase by $1. So in other words, if we are providing more of a public good, it must be funded somehow. So hence, what has to happen is that certain individuals, all individuals have to be taxed more. And that is the tax price. So this is, or this relates to the additional taxes that must be paid by the taxpayer to fund the increased provision of a public good. So then those that are wealthier pay higher taxes. And it is likely that because they are now paying higher taxes, they would want a lower level of expenditure on public goods. And because there are two effects, the income effect and also price effect, that, fire, that operate when we look at the demand for a desired good, the net effect is ambiguous. Now, how is it that we can raise taxes? Well, there are two forms of taxes. So first of all, what we have is uniform taxation. You could also call this a lump sum tax. So let's say that you have 100 individuals, they all pay 100 pounds in tax, regardless of how much it is that they earn. So that is a uniform tax. And the argument is often that this is unfair because you have those that are poor paying exactly the same amount as those that are wealthier. So then what you get is a proportional tax. In this instance, everybody pays the same percentage of income. So for example, everyone pays 25%. Now, obviously, if you earn more, what this implies is that you pay less in absolute terms. So the tax price then for uniform taxation can be represented by this term here. And then the tax payment to fund government expenditure can be represented by government spending or government expenditure divided by the amount of population. So an under proportional system, the total government revenue is equal to the tax rate multiplied by the size of the population multiplied by the average income. Okay, so that is total government revenue. And rearranging that, what we can find is the so-called tax rate. So this is the equation that we can use to gain some insight into total government revenue under a proportional taxation system. So what is the tax payment of an individual? Not the tax rate, but the amount of tax that is paid with by an individual with income I. 
So it is the tax rate multiplied by an individual's income. So for example, 10%, if that's the tax rate, multiplied by 100 pounds. So that would be 10 pounds in that instance. And the reason why we write it this way is because we see that individual income features on both sides of this equation. Why? Because if these cancel out, what we have is the tax rate again. So what this equation tells us is how much individuals in terms of in absolute terms are taxed given the population size and average income. And this leads us to a number of conclusions that are important. And these are the ones that are specifically important. So an individual with an above average income faces a higher tax price. So therefore, they would prefer to spend less or low expenditure on public goods because they have to have a, pay a higher price. On the other hand, individuals with a below average income face a lower tax price. And therefore, because they have to spend less than the average individual or an individual with an average income, they prefer greater expenditure on public goods. Note, there are also a, a different, tax, different tax regimes. So we spoke about uniform, a uniform uh, tax system. So that is when everyone pays a flat rate. In other words, 10%, regardless of how much you earn of your income, that's what you pay. You also get a progressive tax system. So this is one where tax payments increase more than proportionally with income. And you also get a regressive tax system. And this is one in which they increase less than proportionally with income. So please be aware of that. So you do have different tax regimes out there. So now what we can do is we can determine what an individual's choice of most of the most preferred level of government expenditure is. And the reason why we covered tax systems or mentioned them briefly in the previous slide is because this is dependent upon the type of tax that is paid by uh, consumers in an economy. So let's assume that consumers can either spend their money on private goods or they can spend their money on expenditure or contributes money to expenditure on public goods. Now, let's say we have the budget constraint of a rich individual versus the budget constraint of a poor individual. The reason why the slopes of this budget constraint differ is because of a different amount of tax that is paid. And when I say a different amount of tax being paid, in other words, a proportional tax is charged and the absolute value of tax revenue differs across individuals, across a rich individual or across a poor individual. So note, the individual that is well, less well off faces a lower tax price. So this is quite important. So what we see is a substitution effect away from private goods that dominates uh, the income effect. In other words, poor individuals now prefer a higher expenditure on public goods. However, although the preference is for a higher expenditure on public goods relative to those that are better off, the actual demand will differ. Um, and therefore, uh, well, the result is that there is a net effect that is ambiguous meaning that it is difficult to determine what will ultimately happen in terms of the demand for public goods. So here what we see is the dominance of a substitution effect. And that substitution effect dominates the income effect. Now let's say that we are dealing with a different tax system now. So again, what we want to determine is the most preferred level of government expenditure. Well, under uniform taxation, what we see is that there's only one income effect. And what that means is that high individuals will prefer higher levels of public expenditure. So in other words, if we look at this diagram here, this is where wealthy residual individuals are, and this corresponds to their budget constraint, whereas this is where the poorer uh, individuals see their budget constraint, and that point of tangency corresponds to a point that maximizes a utility, and that corresponds to a lower level of uh, lower level of uh, expenditure on public goods. In other words, your preference for public goods increases and also private goods increases with the amount of income that you have under a uniform tax system. So now what we can do is we can trace utility against or, drill or plot utility against the quantity of public goods. In other words, what we can do is we can, can represent the utility point between the indifference curve and the budget constraint at which the preferred level 
of expenditures is maximized, and that is at this point. Note that the preferred level differs from the actual level of preferred expenditure. So what we can have is uh, we can move away from the preferred level of expenditure. In other words, we are actually spending too much on public goods on this side of this dotted line. On the other hand, we could be spending too little on public goods on this side of this diagram. In other words, we deviate from the preferred level of expenditure on public goods, which is represented by the tangency point between the budget constraint observed on the previous slide and also the indifference curves. So what we now see here are preferences for public expenditure that are faced by those that are wealthy, in other words, the rich, those that are in the middle, and also those that are poor. And again, the reason why there is a difference is because potentially consumers that are in the economy, whether they are wealthy or poor or in the middle, can face different uh, tax prices. And this means is that they have a different or a differing preference for public expenditure, for the level of public expenditure. So what we see is we see utility decreasing as we deviate above or below the preferred outcome. So as you see here, this is the optimal level of expenditure the poor would like to see. However, we start spending more than is preferred by the poor, then we have a declining utility. And the same holds for those that are in the middle in terms of income and for those that are also wealthy. Each of these has a different preference for public expenditure. And if we deviate from that preference, in other words, if actual expenditure is higher, well, what is it that happens? Utility is no longer being maximized. And all of these points that are plotted here or reported here are the points at which utility is maximized for the respective groups. So in this example, the rich prefer higher levels of expenditure to the middle class who prefer higher levels than the poor. So on the previous slide, we observed that each individual, the wealthy one, the poor one, the one in the middle, has a different preference for the level of government expenditure on public goods. Now, the question is, how do we reconcile these preferences? Well, what we can use is we can use a voting system. And indeed, this is how democracies function. You vote for politicians and political parties that offer a certain promise. So, for example, some parties might argue for spending more on policing. Others might argue for spending more on health care. And you vote for the one that you agree with and the one that offers the level of expenditure that you prefer. So, ideally... The idea is that what we should have is we should have the choice of the majority or the preference of the majority prevailing. So, for example, let's say you have three friends and you are trying to decide to go whether to a movie or to a basketball game. Well, the decision here is easy. If one of those receives, whether it's a movie or a basketball game, receives two votes and the other one, well, all three friends then will attend the one that achieves the majority of votes. However, the problem is sometimes that the outcome is not as clear when there are more than two alternatives. So let's say that what we have is we have three voters and we have three alternates. Let's call these alternatives as A, B and C. Let's say the voter one prefers A to B to C. In other words, A is the top preference. Voter two prefers C to A to B. And then what we have is voter three preferring B to C to A. So let's assume that we vote only on two alternatives. First, we vote on A versus B. So as voter one prefers A to B, it is A that wins. Now let's say that we vote on A versus C. So now what we have is voter two and three preferring C to A. So it is C that wins. So it appears that C should be the social choice. C is preferred against A, which is preferred against B. But now, what if we compare C and B directly? Well, voter 1 prefers B to C, and then voter 3 prefers also B to C. So in this instance, what we have is we have B being a winner. So we have a set of different outcomes. In other words, there's a voting paradox. Everyone votes, but there is still no clear winner.
So what this voting paradox is, it's, is that because there is no clear winner, there is no resolution. In other words, what we see is vo voting cycles. So let's put it this way. B beats C, but C beats A, but B beats B. So initially B was beating C, but then what we see is A is beating B because of uh, different choices. So the idea is that we have no clear winner. So what we can do is we can have a sequential vote in order to resolve the problem. So first we have a vote of A against B, and then the winner of the vote will be put against C to determine which of those is best. There are, or there is an issue with this, that what may happen is voters might vote strategically if they realize that there is a sequence of votes. So for example, in the first round, voter one may vote uh, may not vote for his or her true preference, but think through the consequences of that eventual equilibrium. So, for example, that voter might vote for B, even though he or she would prefer A, knowing that in a contest between C and B, B will, be, will win, whereas in the contest between A and C, C might win. So, because this voter prefers B to C, he or she initially votes for B. So again, it seems that the true reference might not be revealed. So therefore, this leads us to two questions. Are there voting rules that will ensure a determinate outcome for any vote? And are there any circumstances under which a simple major voting majority will yield a determinate outcome? So what we see that is that there is, does not seem to be an ideal voting system that will reveal true preferences. And this is what Arrow's impossibility theorem deals with. So let's begin with a so-called ideal political system. What are the four characteristics that it should have? First of all, it should have transitivity. So what this requires is that we are able to rank preferences. And if we're able to do so, what we can then say is that A is preferred to B. And because B is preferred to C, what then that means is that A should be preferred to C. So we are ranking A against B and B against C. So we have a ranking of all three and K A comes out on top. And that implies is that if A is preferred to B, it must also be preferred to C because B is above A. Another solution is um, a having a dictator. So so-called non-dictatorial choice. So a simple way of avoiding, avo avoiding uh, voting cycles is give all decision-making powers to a single person, in other words, a dictator. So as long as the dictator's consistent preferences, then there will never be a voting cycle. So in other words, if a dictator prefers A to B and B to C, then A will always be preferred to the two other alternatives. However, if we are in a democracy, what must happen is that the political mechanism must ensure that outcomes do not simply reflect the preferences of a single individual. So that is the essence of democracy. So that is why this might not be a solution, because then we don't have a democracy. Also, what we should have in an ideal voting system is an independence of irrelevant alternatives. So let's say that we have to make a choice between building a swimming pool or building a tennis court. Well, that's very easy if there are no other alternatives. But the outcome will depend on whether there is a third alternative, such as a new library. What should happen is that it shouldn't depend on a third alternative, but in reality, that is what does happen. So in other words, what this rule suggests is that we wouldn't have a problem if we only and strictly had to choose between two alternatives. But obviously, this does not reflect reality. Then the fourth rule that refers to an ideal voting mechanism is that of unrestricted domain. In other words, this mechanism must work no matter what the set of preferences and no matter what the range of alternatives over which choices are to be made. So note that these are the so-called characteristics of an ideal system. And what Arrow goes on, and that is why it's called um, Arrow's impossibility theorem, what Arrow goes on to show is that there is no rule that would satisfy all desired characteristics. In other words, no voting system would comply with these four rules. In other words, we wouldn't satisfy any of these properties. So there are different voting systems. So for example, if we're looking at uh, a rank order voting system, what happens is that individuals rank alternatives and the ranks are assigned by all individuals to these alternatives and then are added together. And then the one with the lowest score wins.
But again, what we would have is that that ranking would still be impacted by irrelevant alternatives. So hence, we have a violation of one of these conditions. So no system satisfies all four characteristics. So Arrow proposes that there is no voting rule that satisfies those desirable properties of a voting system. In other words, a social choice mechanism, because that is what voting is. It represents society's choice. However, under some conditions, uh, a simple majority voting yields a determinate outcome. So this is the case when we have a single peak preference. In other words, there is a single point of preferred expenditure that maximizes the level of utility. So for example, this in panel A, that point is here. So um, in panel B, that point is here. So there is a single point that we should aim for in order to maximize utility. And this means that there is an existence of a majority voting equilibrium, because the choice is clear in this instance. Now, let's say that there are double peak preferences, and this is what we see in panel C, and I'll explain exactly how this works by using example in the next slide. So this preference is not consistent with a single peak. In other words, a single point that maximizes utility. So, for example, we have a point that yields a higher level of utility than the trough here. And then also we have a point here that corresponds to D subscript 1 that also yields a higher level of utility relative to the trough. So this differs. There are clear points which maximize utility in panel A and panel B, that is, but not in panel C. Let's talk about panel C specifically using an example. So let's talk about uh, double peak preference, a uh, two peak preference. And perhaps this is best explained using an example. So let's say that we have um, the prob an individual who has a certain attitude to towards education. Uh, let's say that if the government uh, spends too little on education, the quality of public education is simply too low. In this instance, what happens is that an individual would prefer that no money spent on education because he or she will rather send their children to a private school. Or alternatively, what happens that is if the government starts spending more money on education, that individual's utility declines. Why? Because they have to pay for that education. Nevertheless, that individual views that education as being inferior because still not enough is being spent for his or her preference. However, beyond a certain point, what happens is that so much is being spent on education that we have utility beginning to increase again. In other words, if we look at our graph, which I am reproducing here, what we see is an increase in utility beyond a, C a certain point. So at this point, education is inferior. So that individual prefers that no expenditure is made on education. And as government decides to spend more, utility keeps on declining because the individual still views edu as education as being not of a correct standard. However, beyond a certain point, what happens is that individual sees that education is improving and that is associated with greater expenditure. So what is the result? increasing utility. So for this individual, a high level of expenditure is preferred to no expenditure because that high level of expenditure yields greater utility than no expenditure. But then no expenditure is preferred. In other words, this point here to some expenditure that is at an intermediate level and that does not yield in that individual's opinion a sufficient standard of education. Now let's talk about the median voter. And the reason why we talk about the median voter, because we go back to this concept of single peak preferences. And the reason why we do this is to show how we can achieve a voting equilibrium. So what we do is we rank individuals by the preferred levels of expenditure on a public good. So everyone has a different preference. And what we do is we rank them. And in table 9.2, you see such hypothetical rankings for Lucy, Tom, Jim, John, and also Jill. And then what we do is we identify the so-called median voter. And this is such an individual um, that has half preferring less than that individual and has half preferring more than that individual. In this instance, that corresponds to Jim. Uh, 
And what will happen is that the majority voting will correspond to the preferences of the median voter in this instance. Let's say that everyone votes against the level of expenditure that is less than $1,000. What is it that's going to happen? Jim will vote for $1,000. And all those who want more than $1,000 will also vote for $1,000 because they voted against anything below $1,000 in the first place. So that is why they are now voting for $1,000. Now let's say alternatively there is a vote against anything over $1,000. So what does everyone vote for? Everyone votes for $1,000. In other words, everyone decides not to vote for these options and they vote for an expenditure that corresponds to $1,000. In other words, they vote against anything above $1,000. So that is the level of expenditure that we land up, and that corresponds to a preference of the so-called median voter. So the outcome of majority voting corresponds to this specific preference, $1,000. And remember, this is because we have single peak preferences. Now, how is it that a progressive tax system can result in an oversupply of public goods? So under uniform taxation, what we have is the tax price given by this point here. Now, what we can have is deviations in the system from the tax price for individuals. Now, recall that if we have an individual that uh, has an above average income, then they face a higher tax price. Whereas an individual with below average income faces a lower tax price. So now what we have to do is we have to compare the income of the median voter to that of average income. And the median voter determines the level of public expenditure. So that is another point that we will must also remember. So let's say we have a symmetric distribution of income. In other words, we have a distribution that has uh, where the area under the curve or to the left of the mean is equal to the area to under the curve to the right of the mean. And then if we have a symmetric distribution of income, the median income is equal to the average income. However, let's say that we have a skewed distribution. So in panel B, what we see is we see a skewed distribution. So the area to the left of the mean under the curve differs to the area or to the right under the curve. Which also means now that the median income or the median voter has an income below that of the average voter. So what this implies is that the median, median voter's income is less than the average income. And as a result, the median voter faces a lower tax price than the average voter. Now recall that the outcome of majority voting corresponds to the preferences of the median voter. And the median voter in this instance faces a lower tax price. So what is the outcome of that? Specifically, there is now an oversupply of public expenditure on public goods. And that is because the median voter, which represents the preferences, facing a lower tax price. So that is how inefficiency is introduced or inefficiency arises in the majority voting equilibrium. So what happens with progressive taxation is that the median voter's share of the cost would be smaller than his or her share of the benefits. That is because they have a lower tax price than the average. And they also determine what preferences uh, prevail. So he or she would vote for excessive expenditures for a level of expenditure at which the sum of marginal benefits is less than the marginal cost to society. And that is how we see an oversupply of public goods. So now what we can also analyze in terms of public expenditure is how the politicians behave. Specifically, we can determine what strategies will be taken to maximize votes. If we assume that we have a median voter that represents public preferences, and then we have two political parties. Let's call these political parties the Republicans and also the Democrats. And the Republican Party, or let's assume that the Republican Party takes the position of the Democratic Party as given. And the focus is public expenditure or the level of expenditure. That is essentially what they are representing or advocating, a specific level of expenditure. So we represent the position of the Republican Party by G subscript R. So this is the level of public expenditure that is advocated by the party. And we represent a level advocated by the Democratic Party as G subscript D. So this is a position of the Democratic Party. So for every level, that the Democratic Party 
advocates there is a vote maximizing position for the Republican Party. Now, they ha now, having set our assumptions, what we need to do is we now need to introduce the preferences of the median voter that we see here. Now, let's suppose that the Democratic Party chooses to provide this level, spend this much level of uh, funds on public expenditure. And the Republican Party chooses this level of public expenditure, specifically proposes this level of public expenditure. Initially, they see these as vote optimizing positions. However, we must look at it relative to the median voter that represents preferences. So, given that the proposed level of public expenditure for the Democratic Party is closer to that median voter, that means that the Republican Party at this point in time is likely to get the majority of the votes. So what the Democratic Party has to do, it has to respond. So what the Democratic Party does is it adjusts its uh, proposed level of public expenditure to be lower than that proposed by the Republican Party. So now we arrived at a new point. Now what happens? Now the Republican Party is unlikely to win. Instead, the median voter is likely to vote for the Democratic Party. Why? Because the Democratic Party offers a level of expenditure closer to that preferred by the median voter. So what happens then? Well, because the Democratic Party is likely to lose, it will respond by proposing a level of public expenditure that is closer to that proposed by, uh, preferred by the median voter. And what this, what will happen is in this process is that this process will continue until both parties stand for the same position, that of the median voter. In other words, they represent or they propose the preferences of the median voter so that they can get votes. So the outcome of this theory as to how politicians optimize the level of public expenditure proposed is that uh, this process will continue until both parties stand for the same position, that of the median voter. Now, why does this matter? Well, this results in not much choice being left for the voter. So what voters do is they take a middle of the road position. And this is what the theory proposes because both parties are essentially offering the same thing. There's no choice anymore. However, there are limitations to this theory. In other words, the theory that proposes that voters will take uh, a middle of the road approach. First of all, issues need to be arranged uh, along a single dimension. You are either voting for conservatives, what is offered by conservatives, versus something that is uh, offered by the liberals. The, in other words, there's a choice between two alternatives and the outcome is a single dimension. That of public expenditure in our example. However, what can happen is that we have a variety of dimensions. So, for example, some individuals are liberal on some issues and conservative on other issues. Then the median voter is not well defined and there may be no equilibrium in the political process. Also, there are costs are associated with becoming informed and voting. So these costs, these costs are sufficiently great and may have then a significant effect on voter participation. So let's say that we have a voter whose preferences are close to the median then they will have little incentive to be politically active particularly if they believe that the political process will reflect their preferences anyway so that's the idea that if they think that the political process will be in line with what they would like to see they will not really take part in the political process then so therefore, that is the reason why there is greater political activity or political activism at the extremes, which may offset median directed tendencies. In other words, if you think about in terms of ideology, those are that are on the extremes of their ideology tend to be a lot more active politically than the median voter. So what we've done here is we've essentially set out a theory as to how public expenditure plays a role in determining who is elected and how elections are conducted. And we have also noted its limitations. So uh, what we have done now is we've uh, analyzed the uh, process and democratic process in the form of majority voting for determining public goods expenditures. And we arrive at the conclusion is that there might not be a determinate outcome. In other words, a clear outcome. And even when it, there is one, it may not be efficient. For example, in such a situation where the median income 
or the income of the median voter is below that of the average income. And what we have is we have an oversupply of public expenditure. Also, voters might, uh, may vote strategically and hence will not reveal their true preferences. So that is already what I mentioned on the previous slides. So if there's no ideal systems. How can we resolve this problem? How can we determine public expenditures? So what has happened is the economists have looked at alternative systems. So one such system is the so-called Lindell solution proposed by a Swedish economist called Eric Lindell. What Eric Lindell proposed is that uh, we should mimic the way that the market works in providing private goods. So the efficient level of public goods is the intersection of the collective demand curve with the supply curve. Remember collective demand curve because when we derived the demand curve for the market, we added individual demand curves. And these demand curves were generated by asking individuals how much of a public good he or she would demand if they were to pay a specific price for each unit produced. Let's take a look at the Lindell equilibrium. So in panel A and panel B, we see individual demand curves. And the quantity demanded at different prices that is equal, in other words, this quantity is equal to this quantity. But what differs is how much these individuals are willing to pay for that quantity. So the tax price is P subscript one, and the tax price for individual two is P subscript two. So now what we do is we need to derive the market supply curve. And how do we derive it? We derive this by summing the prices for both individuals at which a specific quantity is demanded. In other words, quantity um, asterisk, G superscript asterisk. Now we introduce the supply curve. So as the price increases, the tax price increase, the supply increases, the quantity supplied increases, sorry, the quantity supplied increases. And what the supply curve does, is it measures the marginal cost of production. Now, as long as the demand curve is above the supply curve, what this implies is that the marginal benefit of consuming an additional extra unit of government expenditure exceeds the marginal cost of obtaining it. So what happens? Well, individuals will consume additional units of government expenditure right up until the point that the sum of the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. So instead of having an oversupply of public expenditure, what we have is the quantity of public expenditure demanded equal the quantity of public expenditure supplied. And such an equilibrium, in other words, the Lindahl equilibrium, is Pareto efficient.